All right, so I wanted just to begin by welcoming everyone. I'm so glad to see you all. So many of my favorite people are here, so I'm, I'm really glad to have everyone here at Chapman uh, for the civil workshop that we're organizing. Uh, so, so thanks for, for coming from all over the world for this, for this meeting. Um, the, the basic idea that I have in mind for the next couple of days is to um, is to is to share some of our ideas and things that we've done over in the past, but also mm -hmm. think about happening, thinking about what's going on in the future as well. So let's see if we can advance my slide. Oh, I have to make, agree to be recorded. That's good. <laughs> Okay, so here is the agenda for it in my mind for the conference. So first of all, welcome everyone here. Welcome to Chapman. Welcome to Southern California. Happy to have you here. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about where things are in terms of the vicinity of, of, of uh, this, this room. Uh, talk a little bit about the talk schedule. And then for my talk, so if everyone has not had a, comp a copy of the agenda, we have all the, th the talks, uh, the titles, and the, and the authors here. So for the next hour or so, I'm going to do some organizational things, but also sort of try to set the tone of the meeting and, and, and try to outline uh, what we've done and the vision for the future. Uh, so, so, the, so this is the talk schedule. And then we also have an overview of the past work. So I'm gonna just kind of give a, a skim of some of the things people in this room have done in the past. And then also think about discussions of future topics. Uh, and so in particular, one of my main uh, uh, goals for this meeting is that after we're all done, we'll all, all have a very clear, crisp idea in our minds about what our next Templeton grant proposal will be about, building on what we've done, but also thinking about some new, new directions. So as we, I'd like to give you all homework assignment that as we, as you're thinking about these talks and listening to what people are talking about, keep in mind about what are some of the most exciting new directions you'd like to work on and, and, and think about how that's going to play out? Okay. And then finally, we're, it's not going to be all work. We're going to have some fun. So on Wednesday, we're going to have an outing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Okay. So first of all, welcome. So the, this meeting is hosted by the Institute of Quantum Studies. That's our institute here at Chapman. I'm the director of that. Uh, and uh, and it's sponsored by the Templeton Foundation, the grant that many of us here are being supported by at the moment. And I'm just so glad everyone has traveled from all over the globe to, to spend time with us. And I'm really looking forward to this meeting. And I'm really hoping that you learn a lot and we can think about uh, uh, future steps as well. So just a few notes. Here's a map of campus. So currently we're right here in the Hassinger Science Center. So congratulations, you all made it. You all made it here. Uh, excellent. Um, where our lunches will be is just the building next door uh, up here. This is called the Aguiros Forum, and we have our lunches there uh, on, on uh, today and tomorrow. And that's going to be in the faculty Athenaeum on the third floor, I think of. of uh, Aguirre's form. And I just thought for fun, I would mention that, that the university is really investing a lot in our institute. And so they recently bought this property uh, off campus for our institute. And so we're renovating that right now. And that will be the future home for our institute. So if you come back in future years for conferences, we'll be meeting over there in our new house uh, just off the main campus. Right? So, so here, yeah, so here's essentially the main campus, but there are lots of buildings scattered around in other places as well. Yeah, and also, yes, yeah, so, so I'll get back to this in a minute. Alexia's talk that she's going to give time to the public talk will also be in this building, just to the north of this building. Okay, so, so uh, I can tell you lots about this new building. If you're interested, I can show you more pictures, but I'll just show you one for now. We've been working a lot with architects. So this is the vision of what this building will look like. Uh, it's an old uh, schoolhouse uh, that, that the university bought. It was built in the 1920s. And it's in the Spanish colonial style of architecture. And so the, the vision is to restore the facade to what it was back in the 1920s. We'll have office spaces and conference rooms and so on inside here. And we'll also build laboratory space over there for experiments. So it should be really neat that facility. 
So uh, if you want to hear more about that, just tell me. I've got lots of pictures. I've been working with architects for the past year to figure out how exactly to put the uh, all the pieces together to make this a great uh, facility. All right. So in terms of uh, dinner, so, so dinner tonight and tomorrow night is, is on on your own. Uh, we'll be we'll providing lunches in the afternoon, but on your own, I can recommend. So right now. We're in, this is the, the campus area, I'm just showing you a map up there. So here's where we are currently. If you just go walk and you walk, I guess, over in that direction, you'll come to this Main Street glass cell. And then all of this area down here is called Downtown Orange or the Orange Circle. And they have really lots of very nice restaurants, shops, things like that. So uh, plenty of places to eat and think, interesting things to do. So if we have a little downtime, I encourage you to watch. It's very easy to walk over there and have something uh, for, for your dinner. Okay. All right. So first of all, many thanks to Sarah Carranza. She's done a wonderful job uh, organizing this meeting. So uh, I really appreciate you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and if you need anything, if you have a, if you have a something that that you need for your talk or or during your your um, during your time here, please ask her or ask me, and we're happy to help uh, accommodate you. <laughs> yeah, so I should also mention, so we have obviously refreshments outside. If you need to use the restroom, it's just down at the very end of the hallway on, uh, on the opposite side of the building. Okay, um, good. So here is the schedule. So everyone should have a copy. So we have a, a pretty full schedule the first uh, today and tomorrow. We have a series of research talks. I'd like to encourage you to be interactive in these talks. I just sat through a week of March meeting talks. Everyone just sits there like a dead fish. So, we so I'd like to think, you know, encourage you. We were trying, we're here to try to learn something. So please, you know, interrupt the speaker, ask questions, probe a new direction, try to get them off the script, right? And so this is also a kind of a dialogue and not just a presentation of results. So, uh, so this is yes. So, so the schedule today is we'll work. Uh, so I'll talk uh, uh, obviously now. Then Alexia will talk. Then Maria. Then we'll have lunch. Then Ronnie will talk. Then Nico. And then uh, we'll have a public talk by Alexia at five thirty. I'll talk about that. And then a similar schedule on uh, Tuesday. And then Wednesday is our our, our outing. Then the conference dinner at my house, will, which will be uh, in Laguna Beach. Okay, so the outing, I had grand plans for this outing. Welcome to rainy, cloudy California instead of warm and sunny California. Uh, but my plan anyway is that if miraculously the rain does not come, we'll meet here as usual and then we'll drive. We have rented a bus. We'll drive down to uh, Crystal Cove, which is a nice beach place nearby for some hiking and, and looking around. We'll have lunch in Laguna Beach, and then stroll it. Laguna is a beautiful beach town, and then looking and doing some beach walking was the plan. Um, so here's a picture of Laguna. I took that picture, uh, and if you want to know, it's so basically it's about half an hour drive uh, to the to the southwest. And there, so so the dinner will be at my house. So my house is the red dot there on the map. And so when you come to Laguna Beach, usually you come along this Laguna Canyon Road. And so to get there, uh, you do go up one, either with this street or that street to the top of the hill, and that's where that's where I live. So that's a picture of my house. And so we'll have dinner there uh, on Wednesday night. Now, unfortunately, uh, depending on how heavy it's raining, if it just maybe a very light mist, we might still brave a walk with, with umbrellas or ponchos, but maybe that's not so nice. Uh, so another possibility I was thinking is we might go to the San Juan Capistrano Mission. It's a very uh, iconic Southern California thing to do. And it's also got a lot of indoor things. So if the rain is heavy, we may drive there instead. Uh, but but um, so, so that that's that's something that, that I'm considering, but we may do something else. Okay. Uh, a very exciting thing. I'm so happy Alexia has agreed to give us our public talk today. Uh, she'll be she'll be talking uh, about quantum energetics and talking about from measurement power engines to uh, quantum technologies. And in particular, she's going to tell us about this new initiative she has created, the Quantum Energy, energy Initiative. And so we should all look forward to hearing about that tonight. And hopefully we'll have a lot of other people from around campus come 
and listen to what you have to say uh, as well. So that's 5.30 tonight. Uh, get in the building just to the north of us. Okay. So when I was preparing this, I was thinking about where we've come since we started this project three years ago. And I wanted to go back to some of the big questions we initially asked. And this is, again, this is a, this is a meeting supported by the Templeton Foundation. Uh, and so um, the, the, the questions we had are, uh, can energy be transferred non-locally? This is something that I was kind of intrigued by. Um, can, can this work that we're doing inform our view of the nature of information and its use as a resource? Do quantum measurement engines point to information and energy being intrinsically linked? What, what, the, what the quantum classical crossover is for this type of quantum measurement engine? How is performance closely connected to the information extraction? And the possibility of work extraction using entanglement as fuel. So it's interesting to see these questions now three years later because we kind of answered some of them. Others I'm still equally as perplexed by now as I was by then. Uh, but we made a lot of progress on other questions we didn't even think about at the time. So that, for me, was a, the mark of a, of a successful, uh, successful project. Uh, and because we we were able to, at least in our own minds, uh, discover a lot of new things and understand uh, so the answers to some of these questions. So in, in a similar kind of way, I'd like us to think about what are the new big questions in light of what we've understood over the past few years uh, and what 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 um, what is the, what are the next steps? So here are some of the things we said we were going to work on. So we, we started it out with this spin-based quantum measurement engine that, that uh, Alexia and Cyril Ward and others started, started us thinking about in terms of uh, the idea being here uh, that if I have so just a very simple system, single spin, say the magnetic field, so that the zero would be the ground state and one is the excited state. If I measure in basis that's not, uh, commiserate with the energy, say not in this Z basis, the zero one, but in some other basis, then that can give or take energy from the system. So there's an exchange then of energy. So the active measurement, not only does it disturb the quantum system as knowing of the textbook measurements tell us it must, but it must also exchange energy with the quantum system, which is something the textbook measurement doesn't really say anything about. So this is something I think, you know, the very fruitful idea we've been, or many of us have been working on, and so some of the things we said we're going to do is looking at this measurement-driven oscillator engine where you measure in, uh, for example, in the position basis. So if this is a harmonic oscillator, you measure in some position basis. You disturb the system by shifting it, by giving some kind of measurement back action. And we talk, talked about an engine cycle where you can then feed back by moving the bottom of where the potential is to extract energy from that process. So that gives a kind of a cyclic engine process where we're able to uh, extract energy. So that was one of the things we worked on where we measure not only position, but also momentum to keep the form of the wave function uh, the, the same. Uh, another thing we said we were gonna work on are non-local Maxwell Demon engines. So this is something uh, schematically represented here in terms of circuits, where you have uh, say two different quantum systems. And the question is, uh, can I say measure one, but then extract information about the other and then do feedback to be able to uh, be able to, if we're in a thermodynamic context, violate the second law using information, but in the quantum measurement context, be able to also then pull energy out of this quantum measurement process using uh, entanglement, right? So I'll come back to that here in a little bit. And finally, the third thing we said we're gonna do is something that, that I've really uh, come to appreciate more and more over time, which is thinking about Qubit readout using thermal sources. So, 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 so far, we're, we're interested in designing the most elaborate, very delicately, exquisitely engineered quantum things to, to optimize the measurement of our system. And here we're kind of going in the opposite direction. We're saying, give me the most dirty thermal thing you can think of, and can I use that to make an efficient quantum measure? And I, and I think I'm really excited about this idea. I think there's a lot more to be done there. Uh, but but we have some nice work that we did on that problem. Okay. 
All right, so what did we do? Just to kind of, it's a recap over the past uh, few years. So we started out with this paper about a two qubit engine fueled by entanglement and local measurements. And I'll get back a little bit to this, uh, talk a little bit more about this later. But again, the idea there is thinking about uh, going beyond a single qubit, so looking at two qubits in the simplest case, and then thinking about uh, how we can use the entanglement between them as a new kind of resource for our uh, engine cycles. Uh, this paper we wrote about fueling a quantum engine with incompatible measurements, where you measure both position and momentum jointly, but weakly. Okay, this is something that you can't do in projective measurements, but if you have weak continuous measurements, you can then measure, uh, say, an oscillator degree of freedom uh, jointly using the position and the momentum. And also being able to extract energy from that process. Thinking about uh, even how a, a single qubit gate can exchange energy between photons and uh, electronic degrees of freedom. So, this is something we did with Benjamin Uard's group. Uh, and then looking at anomalous energy transfer, the things that you wouldn't expect in a classical context. And, and then um, being able to then, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, Thinking about using different types of resources, quantum coherent and thermal light, to do measurements of what the energy cost of that is. So that's again uh, something that we're able to do. Uh, and, and, and as you see the papers stacking up here, these are these are really nice, I think very nice papers, prestigious journals, making a lot of discoveries. So I'm really and really happy with the with that chain. And then going back, back to that paper with Benjamin, uh, this nice paper with Spencer, thinking about post-selection in quantum energy. So if I post-select on a sub-ensemble and look at the energy exchange between my system and my meter, what new interesting features can emerge there? And so I was really happy with this paper with Spencer, uh, and then also being able to use some of the data from Benjamin's experiment to, be able to validate some of our theoretic predictions. So it's something also that I think it's very much in the spirit of this uh, effort. And then some new papers that we have that are not yet published. So we have this energy efficient generation with Maria and company on the archive. Um, this many body quantum vacuum fluctuations, that's, that's, that's really the main scientific part of my talk here in a little bit. I'll tell you more about that. Uh, going from not just two qubits of entanglement, but to a, mini, a bona fide mini body system. And then uh, this anomalous energy exchange of bigger functions for a single qubit gate, also with Maria and company. It's already published, PRA cases. So my, my, uh, I'm, I'm behind the time. You guys are faster than me. Okay, so very good. Who's read the name? Perfect. Thank you. All right, so this is this is our publication record. So I think this has been an extremely productive effort. A lot of discoveries made. So I've been I've been really happy with. All the work we've done on this project. Okay, so let's talk, think a little bit about now about future endeavors. So we've done a lot of work, but what what might what is the next steps? What are we going to work on now? And so here are just some thoughts I put together last night. I'd like to hear your thoughts too. Um, so one of the things is that it, it's been in the news a lot. This work on an, an energy teleportation. So there have been some new papers about this. Ronnie's giving me a sly look over there. Uh, it, this is something to understand more deeply. And maybe this is relevant for work on entangled measurement engines. So I'd like to think about this possibility that there's some connection between these ideas. So, um, so far with our engines, we have a cycle that usually, usually begins and ends in the ground state of that system. So what about we've been working in some other states beside the ground state? What about what are the energetic consequences of that? And our first paper with Lexi and company about uh, entanglement, uh, this entanglement swap engine, we had a really nice analysis of this so-called pre-measurement step, where the idea there is that when you bring in the meter, say if you have two qubits, and you bring in the meter to measure one of them, there is this interesting dance, because to, in order to measure it, you have to interact strongly with it. So you have to then entangle with that. So what happens if you entangle it with the other? And so there's a lot of interesting physics going on there in terms of energy exchange and entanglement dynamics. And I'm just thinking 
that, that really is a fascinating problem. And, and we've only done the three qubit version of it. So maybe it would be interesting to further uh, enumerate that kind of uh, physics in, in, on a, in a more general context. And then other kinds of quantum engines, uh, we've been working at these entanglement measurement engines. Uh, I, I put tongue in cheek, the warp drive, we've got to, come, got to admit the warp drive uh, as our next step. So that's something to think about. Um, and then one thing I'll also be discussing in more detail is this idea that came up in this last paper, this idea of quantum matter. Quantum matter is a natural platform strongly interacting with quantum measurement engines. And so thinking more deeply about that, I think is also something that would be a fruitful Fruitful. We would scratch the surface really of this topic. I'd like to go more deeply into it. And then in bold, again, at the end of this conference, I want to be able to formulate a new set of topics uh, that will be our working set of, of, of topics for a new proposal to our Templeton program on this. Okay. Good. So, so the topic of this uh, conference is something called quantum energetics. It's something we, we, we made up, right? So what is quantum energetics? So it's a close kissing cousin of quantum thermodynamics, uh, which is our field near and deal, dear to our heart, where instead of having a hot and a cold reservoir with uh, an ideal gas, say, working between these two thermal reservoirs, we replace it with an atom or a molecule or, or a couple of quantum dots or whatever you want. And so we have, of course, we have many works on this and people are, are, are really invested and interested in this, in this whole topic. But I think as a new thrust in this whole area, thinking about using only quantum resources, the way to be able to shuffle energy around, not only coherently in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, deterministic Hamiltonian type drives, but also incoherently, either using bath engineering or using quantum measurements. So in other words, using entirely quantum resources and going beyond full speed quantum. And one of the reasons I like this is because I, I, I'm teaching, as I often do, uh, oh, I lost my name today. I'm teaching thermodynamics and, and statistical physics now. And I tell my students, suppose someone comes and knocks on your door and says, I've got some quantum crystals to sell you, and that they beat the Carnot bound of deficiency. You can tell them, you know immediately that they're, that they're selling snake oil because we have a very general arguments about uh, if you have reversible thermodynamic uh, machines, that that's the best efficiency you can possibly get. And the argument is very simple as to why that must be true, because you can simply have two thermal baths, you can have your quantum crystals running one heat engine, and you can have a reversible quantum or reversible classical engine uh, operating it in reverse. Okay, and so you can just show just in a few simple steps that if such a system arises, that that quantum crystal would be able to extract energy out of a single bath and be able to produce useful work, which would generate a perpetual motion. So for this reason, you can say very quickly, no matter how hard our friends in quantum thermodynamics work, as long as they stick with thermal resources, you're never going to beat the Carnot efficiency. So the solution is not to try to beat the Carnot efficiency with thermal resources. Throw the thermal resources out the window. Let's do something entirely new. Let's, let's forget about thermal mass. Let's look at other sources of energy. And this, I think, I think once we have this, then we're no longer chained to the Carnot bound. We can do something very different. And indeed, that's what we find in these quantum measurement engines, that you have a different kind of resources that you're working with. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what, that's what the field of quantum energetics is all about. All right, so let me tell you a little bit more uh, about these uh, measurement power engines just to tell you as a kind of a, a primer on this story. So we can think about measurement as something that, that we know that perturbs or disturbs the quantum state of the system. And that from a point of view of uh, energetics, we say the measurement can not only change the state, but it can also randomly change the energy of uh, this system we're interested in. And as Alexia coined this phrase, quantum heat, the idea there is simply the fact that you know, in classical thermodynamics, we have this uncontrolled or disordered source of energy that's being exchanged, we call heat, between hot and cold reservoirs, for example. So something similar happens in this quantum measurement context, because as we do this measurement, we cannot predict in advance the outcome of this measurement. 
there, and there, therefore we cannot predict uh, this this heat heat flow, which is generally a stochastic quantity. And so there's a certain analogy that can be made between these two different concepts. And the whole point behind these quantum measure engines is to design some engine cycle to be able to extract this energy uh, as useful work. Okay. And so in a nutshell, this is how it works. You start with your quantum system of interest. You have an atom, for example. It goes into some black box. Your measurement apparatus, you generally have to put some fuel in to make this measurement apparatus work. You squish the atom. You do something to it. You disturb it. You distort it. And then you can use that distortion and extract the energy from that distortion in terms of useful work. You reset it and then you restart your engine. So this is sort of the schematic of how all of these engines uh, that we can design uh, work. And all the details, of course, are different, but it's, this is the commonality. All right, and, and why would you want to do this? Well, you can think about this just like any other engine, it's like a steam locomotive, but now it's a steam locomotive for little tiny atoms, right? you can think about uh, using this as a kind of hyper, tiny efficient, hyper efficient engine. So uh, this is this is the, the idea. So it's a source of energy to drive an engine. And of course, just like any engine, you don't get the fuel for free. You have to go find the fuel somewhere. You stop at the gas station and you get some coal or whatever. And now what, what is the fuel of the engine is simply the, the energy you have to put in to do the measurement uh, behind this, uh, behind this front. Okay, so let's let's start with the discussion of um, this idea of that, that's going to begin to put us in the direction of this mini body quantum engine, where we have this synthesis of different ideas. So quantum matter, quantum dynamics, energetics, information, trying to bring these things in of itself. And I think this in itself is a new direction and a new field to begin to explore the interaction between our field of quantum thermodynamics, energetics, with this field of quantum matter. And one way of characterizing it is we know it in quantum information, the type of experiments that Cater does, for example, we know that typically uh, the measurement is relatively easy. You know, once you figure it out, we have these nice quantum limited amplifiers and things like that. But maybe generating entanglement across in some distance can be quite challenging in quantum circuits. Uh, of course, we're getting better at it now, but, but be able to generate and maintain that entanglement is challenging. But in quantum matter, the situation is somehow reversed on its head. The entanglement, you have some strongly interacting constituent parts, the entanglement kind of comes for free because of this entanglement. But then to be able to do the ability to do local measure, come along and say, looking at address a single atom, what are you doing uh, atom by atom? That can be quite a challenge. So, so, it's, so it's a, you know, you have, you have different kinds of uh, trade offs in this mm -hmm. situation. All right, so let me just start by reminding you this of this paper we wrote. Uh, what's going on with the with the uh, this this particular version of the two two uh, atom or two <coughs> qubits uh, entanglement engine? So the idea there is you start with two qubits, but they're detuned from each other. So you start out with the, the, this qubit in the excited state and this qubit in the ground state. And you devise the interaction so that if they were if they were resonant, you would just exchange the interaction. You just have a swap kind of operation. Uh, but because they're detuned, you can't swap perfectly because in, because that swap operation conserves energy. So if one goes down, the one can't go all the one can't go all the way up. It only go part of the way up. But if you do it so it's mostly up, and then you stop there, and you ask yourself, what is my energy of my two qubits separately? Well, most of the time, you will find this one indeed has got the energy down, but this one has the energy up. But if you stop and think about that for a moment, you may say, wait a minute, that means I have the gap, the detuning of the energy that I ended up with, which is more the energy than I started with. So where did this come from? This, this, this comes from this, uh, this measure process. Okay. And, that, and that is really the basic idea behind this swap uh, engine. So we use the entanglement between these two qubits to get a local measurement to be able to extract some energy. Now, some of the time you don't find it down up, some of the time you find it uh, up down, but that's exactly the situation we started with in the beginning. So there's no loss, but there's no gain either. So there's, a, there's just a casting element there. And what you can do with it, this is over here in the other, other figure, is that you can chain these together. You could imagine you have a whole series of these two-level systems 
Each of them are slightly more and more detuned so that there's like an energy ladder, you like you climb up steps. And so you swap, measure, swap, measure, swap, measure all the way down the chain. And eventually at the end of the day, you find that you start out with a very, very high energy. And if the steps are small enough, you can show using uh, quantum mechanical calculations, the probability goes to one. So, so you, the, 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 you get the baby steps, baby steps going up the ramp, you get deterministic up conversion of energy from something small to something large. So this was this nice work that we did uh, with Alexia and friends uh, about using this swamp operation to get a local measurement. But then um, we started th thinking more about this and that led us into this other kind of engine. Oh yeah, uh, right, so, so I think I don't say, right, so I think I already said that, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. Right. So what is the idea behind this ground state, um, this mini body uh, measurement uh, engine? So the idea is to rely instead on the ground state. And what, what's going on there? So we know that the mini body ground state is fairly easy to prepare. You have a bunch of systems, you let them strongly interact, and we couple them to some low energy, low temperature bath. And we just wait. And decoherence will naturally relax the system to its lowest mini body state. Uh, and so it's easy to prepare. And these interactions comes very naturally in dense matter systems. We know if we have a lattice of atoms, uh, this, this happens quite generically. And this incompatibility between our local description and our global description then leads to interesting effects. So the local measurements, uh, if we're now going to measure the system, you can, of course, do very fancy measurements on the system. You can look at non-local measurements, but it's much more natural to think about measuring local, to figure out what is atom one doing, Adam two doing, Adam three doing, this is a much more natural and perhaps easier to implement in the laboratory than the non local measurements. So we combine all these features, local entanglement and local measurement, and then of course local energy extraction. So once I find the system in some excited state, if I can come along and apply an operation to extract the energy plus a reset, that's our engine. So here's the idea. We take the swamp operation I was talking about earlier with this Hamiltonian on the left, and I exchange it in the simplest case of two qubits, where now the interaction instead of is a swamp, it's just a sigma x, sigma x operation. <coughs> so it's more like this Robbie model rather than the Higgs Cummings type model. <laughs> and we exchange this picture for the demon playing around with these uh, local measurements. With this picture on the right, where we're dealing with the entangled state of these two systems that's not prepared with a kind of time dependent operation, just by waiting. And once we have this, this, this uh, global description, you can think about I have an entangled state of the ground, excited, excited ground. I can then imagine doing local measurement, say on party A, and then I can find in this model two options, either the uh, both of the qubits are in their ground state, the local ground states, or both of the qubits are in their local excited states. You might say, wait a minute, how, how is that possible? I thought I was in the mini body ground state. And the answer comes back to, again, it's because there's, a, there's an incompatibility between the local and the global description. So if I able to, I'm able to do strong local measurements on the, the individual systems, because of the fact that's incompatible, the, the, the angle that is not a separate state, there's a possibility where it can have up as our output. Once I have that, then I can do a feedback work extraction, bring it to down down, and then let the down down relax into the angle state. So this is the this is the simplest idea. Okay, we can go beyond that, but that uh, that's uh, as the next step. And so now, why not instead of having two, why not have a whole chain of these things? So I can have a chain of these mini body, uh, a bunch of qubits coupled together by these XX interactions in a long chain. Or why not just have har like harmonic oscillators, a bunch of harmonic masses on springs treated quantum mechanically all linking together. And what we show is that we can then take these models. These are models are, are well known in kinetic matter physics. So we can think about this as being a, a you know, this, this spin chain can be mapped actually to free fermions for a suitable transformation. 
And this model of oscillators is another way of thinking about bosonic excitations in the system. And using these methods from Wilkins matter or field theory, we can then solve both of these models exactly. And then, and then once we have those solutions, be able to then understand what the engine properties are, what's the efficiency, what's the work strategy, and so on. So once we have this mini body system, the picture is slightly more complicated. We have an entangled ground state. You can think about just the local Hamiltonian on the left hand side, local Hamiltonian plus the interactions on the right hand side. And then think about the following ending cycle. So we prepare the mini body ground state of the whole, the whole system. We can do local measurements of energy, possibly finding some high value of energy. <coughs> Uh, optionally, we can turn the interactions off and then extract the energy using local operation, turn the energy back on, and then allow it to relax to the ground state, closing the cycle. So these little arrows schematically tell you what's happening amongst these different options to be able to make this engine work. So one of the there are new important concepts that arise when we study this engine, and one of them is this idea of local energy gap. So this is how much get energy difference there is between the true mini body ground state and a separable state, which diagonalizes its lowest energy eigenvalue of the local Hamiltonian. So, so if I define that gap to be delta, that's an important new parameter that occurs in this, in this engine. And then when we do local measurements, we have to at least give that local energy gap delta, maybe a little bit of a part of the So when we make the local measurements, we have to pay them energy gap delta, but we can also find the other energy, being able to find the entire excited states locally, and that's the energy we reap from this measurement. And once again, we're going to find the efficiency of the engine as the ratio of the work extract of the energy given in the measurement process. Okay. So here are some of the important uh, things that we can define. So we talked about the, the entangled ground state, the local ground state, the gap, how much work that we extract. So it turns out on average, the work we extract is simply the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian in the, in the, in the, uh, in the um, mini body ground state. And it's the local uh, ground state energies. The so-called quantum heat, how much heat you have to give, it all can be given by the work you get out plus this energy gap both energy gap and the efficiency can also express very simply in terms of the work you get out in, uh, in energy gap. so it's, in order to solve these models we, we have a couple different techniques so the fermionic model uh this this is the kind of uh, hamiltonian you would write down for these guys so the sigma x sigma x uh, plus one the ground so the ground state can be represented in terms of these fermionic operators for the bosonic model, we can think about the Hamiltonians being a local and plus interaction term, and we can always write the total the mini body ground state in terms of a Gaussian represented in terms of these vector positions together with some other uh, matrix omega is related to these uh, K K parameters. All right, so some of the things that we find that are interesting. Uh, so in this uh, fermionic case. It turns out that there's a phase transition that occurs as I take in the number of spins to be very large. And so I go from a diamagnetic phase, where if I think about uh, effectively applying a magnetic field where the spins are anti-aligned anti good, as I cross this parameter G, the coupling bigger than omega, the energy gap or the energy value of the spin. When this crossing occurs, I go into an anti-paramagnetic phase where the spins like to be anti-aligned to each other. Uh, and at that phase transition, interesting things happen. So both the work uh, and the efficiency have a vertical tangent at that point, but nevertheless, the values themselves are well-defined. So we can calculate those in this model. So the, the work extraction per spin is, is about 0.2, and the efficiency can be calculated exactly. It's a little more than a half in this case. How do we solve this model? 
uh, is technically involved. So you have to make a Jordan Wigner transformation, which maps uh, maps uh, these spin operators to to fermionic operators. And then once you have that, then you make a Volga-Lubov transformation to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So there's there's some technical calculation involved to, to do that. Nevertheless, we get some nice nice results. Great. Okay, so here is this, so this is the work versus G over omega on this axis and n on that axis. And here is the efficiency again versus G over omega and n on this axis. And we find interesting things happen for the efficiency. You get maximum efficiency right around the critical point there. Uh, and uh, you see that work, of course, will increase as the coupling increases and also scales with n. So the more particles I put in, the more work I, I get out. Okay. And you see the striping effect that comes from frustration in the, in the fermionic model or the spin model because you have this, uh, uh, these spins like to be anti aligned with each other. And so you have this even or odd uh, behavior that occurs, which is the strike. Thing. Okay. Oscillator chain results. So we can also do calculate everything exactly uh, using Gaussian methods of uh, coupled oscillators. And so it turns out this local Hamiltonian in the in the energy, which is related to the which is related to the work, has an interesting feature. It's because you have these long wavelength excitations. So it turns out you get a logarithmic divergence, which is related to like some infrared divergence. So this local Hamiltonian scales like in log n, which is very interesting and different from the spin model. Whereas those local energies, both the um, the uh, the the uh, the local energy of each of the oscillators separately, it's, it's vacuum energy, all these scale like n. Okay? And so when I calculate the efficiency, I get something that looks like n log n uh, divided by n log n plus n. And so the efficiency for this one dimensional case, for this is dimension one, two, three, the efficiency actually keeps on growing uh, logarithmically. So it approaches one asymptotically as you go to a very, very large uh, oscillation number, which is uh, remarkable. Yeah, so this is the scaled work. This is the scaled efficiency. And we did this in one, two, and three dimensions for oscillator chains. <laughs> and so generally, you see that, that uh, in all these cases, the work scales like the number of oscillators in the system. But in one dimension, it's best in terms of efficiency. All right. So, so, so far, I talked about all the fun and exciting things. What are the challenges? The challenge is, is I, I alluded to this earlier, you have to make these local energy measurements come along and say, what is the energy of atom one, atom two, or oscillator one, and so on. We have to make these measurements that are fast and in the local energy basis. So this is a challenge. So we did some calculations about this. If you bring in a meter, for example, and couple the meter to that system, do the measurement, and so on and so forth, it's possible. But the coupling strength of the meter to the molecular system must be much larger than the other couplings in the, in the neighborhood and exceed it by an order of magnitude. Now, you might say, well, that sounds queer because you, you, you're, so you're trying to bring in a huge amount of energy to extract a little bit of energy. So isn't that, isn't that, defeat, isn't that self defeating? And my claim, my rejoinder to that is no, because in principle, you can reuse that energy of the meter. The meter uh, over and over here. So you can think about this as not as a fuel of the engine, but as a catalyst. Of the engine. And then finally, yes, yeah, so, so, but, but I still think that this strong uh, meter coupling is the outstanding experimental challenge to implement this quantum engine in the lab. And so indeed, when Kater and I and, and the group were discussing about what to do experimentally, I think probably it's easier to do this version we do with Alexi in terms of the swap and local measurements. It's less technically challenging to do that measurement. Okay, so I'm I'm perfectly on time here for my the conclusion. So so here is my overall conclusion. So we can think about in this in this in this project that the total work on average that we extract is the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian minus the not not worrying about the interactions in the global ground state subtracted from the local vacuum. So that's the work to extract in this process. 
it's proved by averaging the realizations of the of the excited local energies with the respective probability of the current. So you can that's that's the way you prove that explicitly. The so-called quantum heat, the energetic price of the measurement, is the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian in the ground state minus the global vacuum. So again, this tension between the local and the global is very important in the story. And so we prove that the efficiency is controlled by this local entanglement gap, the gap between the smallest energy eigenvalue of the local Hamiltonian and the true ground state. And so finally, yeah, so we show that this energy, this quantum measurement engine, it, it has to have a combined presence of this many body entanglement plus the local energy measurements and extractions to, to pull out the energy. Okay. That's it. Thank you. So now we have time for questions or discussion or a break. So, yeah, so there's a question about the previous slide that's. Uh, I think like I've also been hung up on this, like. Uh, you know, if I have to like use fuel to operate my engine, you know, isn't this a redundant or problematic in some sense? And you say that you know the coupling energy meter can in principle re be reused. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Well, we so so. So the operation in which you do is you have another party you bring in that has its own characteristic energy, its own coupling, and so so when you when you couple to the to the system and you measure say the local meter it's in some variety of states, then you infer from that what's going on with the uh, with, with the system. Okay, and so and to do it quickly you need to have a large energy associated with that. But in principle, there's nothing that stops you from then once you register that to go then do the same thing to the next to the next uh, to the next uh, party and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can simply continue to do the same operation using the same meter as long as it's not a destructive measurement. But but maybe the other part you're concerned about, Spencer, is that of course we have to spend energy to do the measure, right? And and, and that's really as I said, that's the fuel of the engine. And that's an important part of the of the discussion, um, and that has to be there for any kind of engine. So no engine can be operated that doesn't expend any fuel; otherwise, you generate energy out of nothing. So, like I said, the first law. Any other questions? Okay. Swan two or three dimensions. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it has essentially has to do with infrared divergence. Different in one dimension, you have this logarithmic correction comes out in one dimension, but not in two or three. Uh, so if you look at like just the entropy of this kind of system, entropy generally grow, grows like like typically in entropy goes like area, right? For a three-dimensional system for von Neumann entropy, but for one in one dimension it grows like log in. And so so this is kind of a peculiarity. But but that is that is that exact peculiarity that was responsible for this high efficiency. Is this a finite time meeting then? Um that's a good question. No, but I, I haven't said anything about power, for example, in this in this uh, process. So we yeah, we assume that the we model the measurements. The measurements are assumed to be instantaneous, but but of course in reality they take some time. And then the and then the, and then the energy extraction process also takes some time. So uh, it's a good question, but yes. Yeah, so so so, you, we, so yeah, we didn't we didn't budget. You know the time for this for this engine. So, but but when you look at power, I think some some of our other works work look at power, right? Did you do this in other papers, Alexia? But not but not in this one. Peter, so maybe just to think more broadly. So when we start talking about many body systems and interacting many body systems, I think we're crossing past the, the statistic 
go the mechanics community where they're interested in like eigenstate normalization hypothesis, these many body scars where you've got these equally nearly equally, equally spaced energy eigenstates in the system. And are there ways that these sorts of projects can kind of connect to those hot topics in that area of physics? Yeah, I think it's a good good question, Cater. Um, and this is kind of what I was getting to when I say let's go beyond the ground state, right? You know, what about looking at some of these other other issues? Yeah, the interesting thing about the mini body formalization or the the uh, ETH you know, uh, hypothesis is that is that there's no thermal baths there at all, right? It was just have one kind of isolated quantum system and trying to figure out in some sense this, this, if, if such a thing self normalization exists, what you can say about it. So I think that's related. This is a related topic, and I think indeed it would be interesting to try to if we can explore the connections between. Them. So generally speaking, is the efficiency affected by coupling strength between those uh, chain or Yes. Um, right. Uh, so if I go back to, yeah. So yeah. So in the qubit chain result, so this G is the coupling strength between the two uh, neighboring spins, and omega is the energy gap of a single spin. And so you see that both the work output and the efficiency are functions of that coupling strength, how big one is relative to the other. So you see that the, the yellow is the highest efficiency. It's around a little more than a half. That occurs around the critical point. So if you have either a very low coupling or a very, very strong coupling, you actually have low efficiency. And what is exactly the role of vacuum fluctuations? Yeah, the vacuum fluctuations are critical because uh, because essentially what we're doing is is we say we prepare the system in the many body ground state, and in terms of a local description, you can think about there are different ways of thinking about this. But you can say that that includes the fluctuations in the local uh, observables, right? So in some sense, what you're doing is you're is you're realizing those vacuum fluctuations by making these measurements. You're making them real in some sense, right? And then extracting the energy from it. So you can think about this, that this is exactly a quantum vacuum fluctuation engine. And there's been a long sort of sci-fi version history of this, where you extract energy just from the vacuum for free, right? But actually, this is the rigorous version of that, where you show you don't get it for free, but by by but by doing this measurement. You have that, that that is costly, and that and that and that and that, uh, that's what saves synergy conservation. Can you quantify the energy provided by the measurement this? Yeah, so the so the essentially the way we do that, there, I mean, there there is sort of an easy way, and there's a more challenging way. To do that. The easy way is that you simply look at the energy of the system before and after the measurement. And say the measurement had to at least provide that much energy, right? So that's sort of an energy conservation argument. The more challenging way is to do a microscopic modeling of the meter, right? And then study the energy flows that come in and out uh, from this model. And that and that's something that we did, for example, with Leia and uh, Alexia on this first uh, swap engine. Okay. Um. Question. Well, at the beginning, you were talking about uh, beating the thermal efficiency by using quantum resources instead of thermal resources. And uh, um, I wanted to understand what exactly do you mean by beating thermal efficiency when there are no, I suppose there are no temperatures, there are no bats. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe I misspoke. So it's not that, that I'm beating the thermal efficiency, just that it doesn't exist. There's no such concept. Okay. I don't have these thermal bats. Okay. Yes. I mean, and there's a there's a way I guess you can think about if you think about the measurement process itself as a thermodynamic system, then I guess you could. I mean, there's so some people can think about this as either like a zero temperature bath or infinite temperature bath or some way of doing that. I just don't think it's the right way of thinking about the measurement process. I mean, if there are thermodynamic connections there, but I, I think this discussion. Would it's more fruitful than that. Okay. Um, 
That's right. Yeah. So that's related to this frustration question. I think our calculations were mostly done for, for periodic boundary conditions. But yeah, you can also do it for open boundary conditions. So yeah, so then then the frustration issue is not no longer no longer an issue. So you don't you, you, everyone can be separate from anybody else. Or one condition. Mm -hmm. Does that concept of heat enter into this analysis when you like let the thing relax back with it? No, that, that's yeah. So, so you say that that's sort of the energy waste of the engine is that is that when you go from the local ground state to the entangled ground state, that energy is lost to this. This is zero temperature at that, right? So, so that's like the that's where the inefficiency arises from. You expect these results to be generic for uh, many of the quantum models, for example, when you start introducing a long range interaction, things like that. Yeah, this is a good question. And that's something I think we should start thinking about. So again, this is sort of scratches the surface of this. Um, but, you know, so one of the other things that people have been thinking a lot about recently are these quantum batteries, about how you can use some entanglement to power quantum batteries more efficiently yeah. or more powerfully. And I think the same kind of issue about, you know, if you have long range interactions, uh, this could become relevant there. So, so it would be interesting to look at maybe some of the five model or something like that. It could, you could sell, solve similar kinds of questions. So I think that would be fascinating. Yeah, that's right. So right now, for example, we show the work scales within, right? But could you get some kind of polynomial speed up where the work scale like n squared? That would be really cool. Is there any generalization to like 2D third system or even 3D system? Uh, so I had I discussed in the, the oscillator case, I discussed multiple dimensions. So let's see. Yeah. So 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 for the oscillator case, of course, if, if instead of just having a chain of oscillators on a line, you can make a mattress, right? Where you have oscillators in two directions or even three directions, like a model of a of a of a, uh, a 3D lattice, right? And so you can solve everything exactly in, in whatever dimension you want. And so this is the dimensional layer. So this is, you can't really see it very well, but this is one, two, and three dimensions um, on the right hand side. Same here. So, but the lattice is flat right? What's that? The lattice is flat Square lattice, square lattice. Yes. Or, or cubicle. Can we calculate like work fluctuations in this model? Because there's no trade off between. Oh, and work. you're good. You're good. Yeah. This is what the referee said, right? The referee <laughs> said, what about fluctuations? So we, we, we can do it. We've been working on it. It's done now, but I didn't talk about it here. Yeah. So, 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 so the work, the fluctuations are there. In particular, I was interested in the fluctuations here, the critical point. And so, but they were, they, they turn out they don't diverge just like the working efficiency. They also have a, uh, a tan vertical tangent, but they have a finite value yeah. at that point. So it's so fluctuations don't completely swap, but that's a good question. Tricky. Yeah. All right, how are we doing on time? Perfect. All right, if you guys want another coffee or something, or before we start with Alexia, 